How fare ye? That's my way of saying how are you. And hello. My name is Michael and I want to welcome you to what I call my meeting house. I've been reading a lot of interesting books about the American Revolution here in North America. And I found one in particular that's really quite different. You've probably heard of Benjamin Franklin or Paul Revere or I'm sure George Washington, but this book is, doesn't include any of those people. It's a book called Katie's Trunk. But to understand it a little better, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. You see, what the story takes place in somewhere around 1775. Now that's about 245 years ago. So we're all going to have to imagine what it might have been like back here in the English colonies here in North America. What was it like? It was difficult. Why was it difficult? Well, there was a struggle going on. A struggle? Yes, a struggle. You see, the king decided to do something that really hadn't been done the same way for about 150 years before that. So I have to go back even further to the days of the pilgrims and the 1600s and the Puritans. When they came here, they would decide to raise taxes to help them build a road, perhaps. So maybe they needed a school or even a, a new meeting house. So they would all agree together to pay extra money, called a tax, to help build these things. So that all went on for 150 years until the, oh, the 1760s, the early 1700s. Now what had happened is that there had been a, a very serious war between England and France, and that was a, all over the world, and even here in North America, where the French and the English fought against one another. And of course, wars are very expensive. So when the war was over, the king did something that really hadn't been done the same way in a long time. He decided that the colonies here in North America would help pay for that war. Well, there were a lot of people who agreed with that idea. And that's not surprising because, you see, we were English colonies and the king was our king. We were English citizens. However, even though we were English citizens, we didn't have anybody to actually represent us over in England, in London, 3,000 miles away, in what was called Parliament. Parliament is like our Congress. It's the House of, uh, in our country, we call it the House of Representatives. They called it the House of Commons. In this country, we call it the Senate. Back in England, they call it the House of Lords. And that's the place where laws are made. And the king, of course, would tell Parliament what he would like, and Parliament would pass the laws. So they passed these laws without representation from the colonies. And the laws sometimes directly affected the colonies, such as these tax laws after the Seven Years' War. So if you've ever heard the expression, no taxation without representation, that's what it means. If you haven't heard that expression, you have now, and you will quite often if you read more about the American Revolution. Now, we had no choice but to pay these taxes. So those people who agreed with the king, were loyal to the king, were called loyalists. Those who did not agree with the king, and there were many people that fall into that category, they became known as patriots. Now, at first, they were just discussions that went on back and forth when they disagreed. Then the disagreements got more serious. They began to call each other names. The Patriots would call Loyalists Tories, which was a nasty name. And the Loyalists would fire right back and call the Patriots Rebels, which was another nasty name. Now, these families, up until this time, if they when they, when they weren't disagreeing with one another, they would help each other and work together and the children would play together. And they would all help and work to build their community together. But unfortunately, that began to fall apart. So those discussions started calmly, kind of to name calling. Before you know it, 
fights began to break out. And even homes, the houses of these people, were damaged on both sides. Damaged on purpose. They would be vandalizing, just painting different things on other people's houses, were destroying things, stealing things. It was a scary, nasty time. Well, this story is about one of those nasty times, one of those events. It's all about a little girl named Katie. The book is called Katie's Trunk. What's a trunk? Well, a trunk is a big box. Not everyone had a dresser or a, a bureau to store their clothes in. So they would have a very large box, usually with a rounded top. And it's called a, a, a trunk, and it was for storing your blankets or your clothes, your dresses, things like that that you weren't using at the time. Now, I wonder what a trunk has to do with this story called Katie's Trunk. Hmm. Can you think of what it might have to do with? Would you like to see what's inside? Okay. Let's dig in and take a look at Katie's Trunk. Katie's Trunk by Ann Turner and illustrations by Ron Himmler. When I'd been bad all day, hiding Hattie's doll under the sofa and never telling her where it went, Mama just sighed and said, I should sit you down to sew long seams all day and get the goodness straight inside. Katie, what is wrong with you? Well, I couldn't tell it with a name, though I felt it inside, the way a horse knows a storm is near. I could feel the itchiness in the air, the wind bringing cold. The clouds tumbling over the trees, bringing rain, a sour rain. Must be, Mama sighed. She sat down to tea. It must be all this trouble and fighting. Why, it makes me skittish as a newborn calf. All this marching and talking of these letters your papa speaks of. That tea they dumped in the harbor. Mama's hands shook tea in the harbor is wasting God's good food. Brother Walter said, that's not the least of it. It will get worse. She peered at him. How could it get worse, Walter? Then she shut her lips on the words. Already we had lost friends, neighbors, families that we had played with on the green and helped with building their new barns. Celia Warren would no longer speak to me. Her brother Ralph no longer spoke to Walter. Sometimes I heard that word hissed, Tory, like a snake about to bite. The rebels were arming, brother told me, and were marching and drilling beyond the meadows. I'll never forget the day they came. The sun was hot on the mill pond, and Walter, Hattie, and I watched the dragonflies peel their skins off on the long grass and then fly away. Something like smoke rose over the road, and out of it, Papa came running. Get your mother! Hide in the woods! The rebels are coming! We ran to the house. Mama's face was like a white handkerchief. She shoved a piece of pork pie in our hands and ran us out to the thick woods where we could hide. Crouched in the underbrush, I felt like an animal in a trap. Suddenly I was so mad I could not still myself. I raced for the house. Mama's fierce whisper trying to call me back. But I would not let John Warren, Reuben Otis, 
hurt our house and our things. It, it was not right. It was not just. It was not fair. Inside of our parlor, I touched each thing that I loved. Mama's pineapple teapot, the silver tray shining like a moon, the pictures of all our kin ranged across the wall. Home. Then I heard voices by the door. Reuben Otis, John Warren, Harold Smith and others, not our neighbors. This'll be fine pickings. They paused on the front step and ripped the knocker off the wood. I ran into Mama and Papa's room, looking, just looking for some place to hide. If they could steal, they could hurt as well. There was Mama's wedding trunk, big and black and domed. I pulled up the trunk lid and I hid under the dresses. In the shutdown darkness, everything was muffled and far away. The door slamming, their footsteps next to the parlor. English goods. Someone spat. Something hit the floor and broke. My breath stuck in my throat. Someone cursed and I heard Reuben say, Mr. Gray has money here. Look hard for it. John Warren spoke of arms that they could buy. The air closed around my mouth like a black cloth. I bit my hand and prayed, though I was never much good at that. I thought my words might go up to God like bubbles in a pond to the silver top where they would burst. Please, God, don't let them find me. Don't let them hurt us. Let me breathe. The footsteps came closer. Someone leaned against the trunk. My breath got caught somewhere between my stomach and my chest, and I could not get it back. There wasn't enough air. John Warren said, Fine dresses and silver in here. He pulled up the lid, and the sweet air rushed in. I sucked in a breath as a dress was snatched out. The rustlings drowned their words. Another dress went. Then a hand touched me. I wanted to bite it, to make him jump and shout, but, but I stilled myself. Maybe he didn't know. Suddenly he shouted, Everybody out! The Tories are coming! Back to the road! Hurry! And he did not close the lid. And then footsteps sounded out the door. Sudden quiet. My heart beat loud. As loud as the horses galloping down the road. Quiet as quiet, I crept to the window and looked out. No one. Puffs of smoke far down on the green. A horse thudding past, riderless. Someone's hat blowing by in the gusty wind. Would I ever play with Celia again? Would I always wear this name, Tory, as if it were written right there on my chest? I sat down. I hugged my knees and I began to cry. Walter ran inside and hugged me so tight my nose stuck to his shirt. Mama, Papa and Hattie came next, white as the moon and as silent. Only Mama scolded. Katie, leaving us that way. And her voice broke. She sat beside me. And she stroked my hair. 
Papa looked out the window. Oh, it's, it's not bad, dear ones. It's just a skirmish. No one's hurt that I can see. Walter's mouth snapped open and then shut tight. I wiped my eyes on his sleeve. A sudden thread like a song ran through my head. When Mama asked me to sew straight seams to get the goodness straight, I knew I couldn't do it. But John Warren had. When I hid in the black, stuffy trunk, when my breath got lost in Mama's dresses, he left the trunk lid up to let me breathe. And then he called the others away. He left one seam of goodness there, and we were all tied to it. Papa, Mama, Walter, Hattie, and me. must have been a very scary time for Katie and her family. What do you think? Well, I've enjoyed having you here with me in the Meeting House. Thanks for coming via our Facebook page, or maybe our website, or even on our YouTube channel. But I hope it won't be long before I get to meet you in person, right here at the museum. So, until then, fare thee well, my colonial friends. <laughs>